Well, tonight, we've invited a man from, well, he, he lives over in Hamilton. And we won't hold that against you, sir. So, uh, you live in town. We promise. Anyway, I <laughs> met Dennis many years ago when he was a youth pastor. Uh, but uh, the last year or so, we've just uh, become more acquainted. And uh, he's a young man that God's got his hand on at, uh, for this nation. His burden is for the nation of New Zealand. Come on. And it's not that he doesn't have burden beyond this place, but he really is one that's saying, I want to see New Zealand reach for Jesus. And he's doing something about it. He's stepping out. And uh, we just think it's, it's fantastic. So Dennis McCaskill from Hamilton, come over here and uh, <laughs> share with us what God has put on your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, I'm on. That's even a better start. Good evening. Change Point, how are you doing? Oh, that's useless. <laughs> oh, is that good for you guys? Uh, good evening, Change Point, how are you doing? Good. Oh, that's a little better. That's good. We, we will be here for a wee while. No, just kidding. So good to be here. It's such a privilege and an honor. Thank you, Pastor David, uh, for inviting me. I am so excited about tonight and what God does. Uh, there's not a place that I don't turn up where God does something, and it's not me, it's God. And I like what, um, is, is Bethel okay here? Is, am I not going to get stoned from the back rows? Is Bethel okay? I like what Bill Johnson says. It's Jesus inside and he wants out. And so I'm just letting them out, man. I'm just letting them hang loose and see where we go. It's such an honor to be here tonight. And I, I believe I've got a really great word for you tonight. And, and it's just been bubbling on the inside and I'm excited about it. But before we do, I, I really enjoyed that song by Keith Green we sung just before. And I remember when I was a child, I was brought up in a Christian home, full swing revival. When, when I was two, my parents got saved in a church, tiny little church in Taita, in Lower Hutt. And uh, it, was, it was an Anglican church, St. Matthew's, and it was in full tilt revival. Little 50-seater church, not much bigger than this row here. And every Sunday, there was 250 people jamming in to get into that church. And I tell you what, this church was wild. Our vicar would do the cha-cha. We'd go out to the church lawn, and then we'd all grab each other's hips, and we'd start walking along, and, and we shall go out with joy, and da-da-da-da-da. You remember that song, Dave? Yeah, that's, that's an old one. Uh, that's Age Impaired. Let's be PC tonight. It's age impaired, that song. And so anyway, and it was wild. I mean, this was an Anglican church and people were falling over the pews. And if you know Anglican churches, those old ones, they used to have big barriers in front of the chairs. So when someone fell over, it was a huge commotion. They took out the next row and uh, my dad got saved by listening to a trumpet. Look, when the Holy Spirit shows up, all the rules go out the window, it seems. I don't know, I don't, I don't quite know. But anyway, Keith Green Going back to that, um, he was a powerful man of God. Anyone know anything about that man of God? Sadly, in 1982, he died in a plane crash with two or three of his children, and uh, it was a huge tragedy because that man, in the space of 10 years of being a Christian, completely changed the face of Christianity on earth forever. He was responsible at his death when his wife, Melody, went and did a big tour about Keith's life and the call to missions, he was responsible for the resurgence of missions worldwide. His, his story so shocked people. Hundreds of thousands of youth joined YWAM and went out to the mission fields. And he, uh, his life was just so impacting. I remember when I was a Christian, I read his book called No Compromise. Now, if you want a good kick up the rear end, I tell you what, that book is awesome. In fact, I recommend that book. You go get it. It'll probably be in church library. If you've got a church library, Pastor Day's probably got it. Go steal it off him. Go to the Christian bookshop and get it because that book revolutionized my life. He was a man so passionate about the things of God that he let nothing and nobody hold him back. And yet in such a short period of time, he changed the face of the world. That's pretty serious, man. And there was a Kiwi connection in there. His mentor, apart from being Leonard Ravenhill, who was a fiery evangelist, revivalist, there was, 
the good old Kiwi guy, Winky Prattney. Anyone ever heard of the Winkmeister? He's a mentor, he's a friend of mine, and I'm so privileged to know him. Uh, Winky, another man who's just been so awesome, and he's just gone out and done the simple stuff, and God's used him to speak to millions of people every year, even through his tragedies and recent sicknesses. He hasn't allowed that to hold him back, and he's gone and done marvelous things. And here's, here's something about Winky, a Kiwi, a humble Kiwi guy. Every major revival since the 60s or 70s has had one key element, Winky. He's gone in and he's mentored the people that have been in charge of the church, who have been ministering. Brownsville Revival, anyone ever heard of that? Oh man, that, that changed my life forever. And I'll tell you how later on. Winky Prattney, wink, uh, he winkied. Uh, Steve Hill from the Brownsville Rev Revival, who was this mad preacher, but awesome man of God. And, and all the way, the Toronto Blessing, Winky was in there. Even in Bethel, his best friends and mentor to Bill Johnson. And so it's awesome just to see these passionate Kiwis having influence, punching above their weight, and God using them. And again, um, you know, even here, David Dishram, world famous, not only in New Zealand, but around the world. So, you know, we Kiwis have got a thing or two. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote a book. Every evangelist writes a book, don't they? And so I better do this very quickly. Down the back, you can get a copy of my book, Grace Under Fire. If you like what I say today, you'll love what I've written there. And usually it's 20 bucks, but we got it down there in 10, for $10. Also, we got a CD, DVD pack of our conference we ran this year with Reinhard Bonke. Who likes that cat? He's pretty cool. And so we had him over at our conference this year, and so we've got some resources down there. I just want to pray, and let's, let's, let's open this thing up to the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful that you are here today. Your word says where two or more are gathered, you are also here. And so, Father, I'm expecting great things today. Lord, help us today to move with your Holy Spirit because your Holy Spirit's always moving, but Father, we want to move and get captivated and catch something of what you're doing here tonight. Father, I want to break every stronghold that may be holding people back tonight, that may, may cause them just to not step forward into the all things, not step forward into the spirit of this evening. Father, I thank you that your word uh, says that in your name, we are healed, we are saved, we are set free, we are delivered. And tonight, Father, that's my expectation, that there will be salvation, that there will be deliverance, that there will be healing. And Father, that, that, that things will just get absolutely awesome in your name. Amen. Well, a bit of my quick story. I was brought up in a Christian family. Would you believe it that I was a skinny little runt for most of my uh, teenage years? I was 50 kgs up to the age of about 19. And uh, I dropped out of school. I did it the best way you could ever do. I failed school C once and I thought, well, I'll go again and I'll try sixth form and I dropped out of both. And so I was, I was in a blaze of glory, baby. I failed at everything, even being the orange boy on the rugby team. I mean, my rugby career was so distinguished that I was in the third 15 and left right out in the third 15 because there wasn't a fourth 15. I mean, it was, it was pretty useless. And so school for me was torture. And so my parents put me into horse racing because my dad used to be a farrier and used to do horse racing, harness racing. And so harness racing is not when you're sitting on top going, eha. It's when you're behind in the buggy going, look out, bullets flying out of the horses, you know what, you know, so that's, that's the distinct difference, and that's what I used to do, and um, it was a little more glamorous than that, and so I had no um, self-esteem, I was beaten up, bullied at school, and, but something happened with these horses, these 500 kg animals would listen to me, I got on really well with them, and I shot through the ranks of harness racing. In fact, so much so, I became the youngest person to get my race day license in the history of New Zealand, and uh, became the youngest trainer ever as well. I worked in a stable, or two stables, and we had million dollar horses. I worked in the stables that, that had some of the best horses in New Zealand and the world, and it was awesome. You can imagine my self-esteem went through the window. I thought I was the man. My tiny little chest protruded out a little bit more than it did in high school. And everything was going well, but 
I was still so empty inside and I craved for attention and I craved for people to love me. But even when people loved me, when I had the money, when I won races and sold horses for big bucks, had huge parties, none of that ever filled me up. And I was always searching. It was during that time when I got addicted to pornography and got addicted to alcohol and became extremely volatile and angry. Such was my anger that my own teammates, if they thought they'd be funny and say, Dennis, you're a homo, I'd turn around and belt them stupid with trotting helmets, which are like motorcycle helmets, and just, I was absolutely volatile. And one day, my boss saw that my work ethic was slipping, and so he said, Dennis, I think you need to get out more. I'm going to get you a car so you can learn how to drive. And so I had my learner's license, and I wanted to get my restricted, and he got me a car, right? It was a Holden Commodore V6. Pink. You remember those pink cars? That's, that's the one he got me. And so it wasn't very manly. But anyway, the problem was I couldn't drive. You don't get someone with a v, uh, that can't drive a V6, right? So, but he did. And uh, he said, okay, drive to the end of the driveway and back. And you know those farm driveways can be quite long. Well, I thought, well, that's not long enough. So I drove to the end of my driveway and back, which was 5K there and 5K back. On the way back home, because this is in Pukekohe, and we're right next to that V8 racetrack, I, I got a rush of blood to the head, and I started putting my foot down on the pedal, and I was going 130 down the straights, 90 around 45 corners, thinking I'm the man, and I shoot up a hill going 130 k's per hour. And then I remembered that this hill dropped down, had a dirty great big T intersection and, and, a, and a power pole sticking up at the end of it, too late. I'm up that hill, I'm in mid-air, and I realize one thing, brakes don't work in mid-air. It's one of those matrix moments. Now, I, I said this at a, a, a full gospel businessman's in Otrahonga the other day, and they're all, they're all age-impaired over there, okay? Like, I mean, the youngest person was 80. And I said, have you ever watched a Matrix movie? And I got nothing. But anyone here ever watched a Matrix movie? Yes, half. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, the rest of you need to stop being so religious and go and watch the movie. It's awesome, okay? <laughs> Just kidding, okay. I'm going to get in trouble. And you know how they got those cool slow motion, wah, kind of things like that. That's what it was like when I was heading towards this power pole. It was just like flashbacks, everything in slow mo. And I just knew I was going to die. I just relaxed and came to that point where this is going to suck. You know, this only ends one way. And then all of a sudden, I hear this voice say to me, live for me or die. And instantly, I knew that that was the voice of God because of my upbringing. And of course, I thought, well, I really don't have a choice here. <laughs> so I cried out, yeah. Miraculously, that car swerves five meters in midair and lands in a gravel driveway. I'm still going 130 Ks, baby, and I do what you do not do in a gravel driveway going 130 Ks per hour. Slammed on that brakes. Mate, I took out 150 meters of post and rail fencing, not wimpy little number eight wire, baby. I mean, I took out horse fencing. And uh, my Holden V6 pink Commodore uh, spun out around in the paddock, hit a water trough, and came to a screaming halt, and there was bits of timber sticking out every possible place in that car. Every window was shattered, every tire was punctured, but I checked myself over, not a scratch, not a cut. No, nothing. God had protected me. You think that'd get my attention, right? Uh-uh, I'm, I'm pig-headed. I went on living my own way, and I got involved with a girl who lived in Cambridge, and so I decided to quit harness racing because her parents said, there's no way he, uh, my daughter's gonna marry a dumb harness racing boy, so I thought I'd become an ar architect. I don't know why straight lines drive me crazy, but it just seemed like a, a brilliant idea. Hey, beat an architect that's next to a lawyer or something. Any architects in the house? And so, um, you know, I just thought that'd be cool. And so I arrive in tomorrow's all getting ready. It's my birthday and she dumps me. Oh, that's cool. That's, that's how it works, guys. I'm sorry. And so my whole life shattered and I'm down in the pits and I meet a friend on the street and he says, hey, Dennis, you know, I haven't seen you for, since high school, but do you want to come to church? And I wanted to smack his head in. How dare you invite me to church? But I ended up coming anyway. And I arrived late. And this is the first time since I was a child that I'd ever been into a Pentecostal service. The rest of the time, my parents went to a conservative church, and that's all good, man. But anyway, I arrived late. 
and it's an AOG church of about 12 people in Morrinsville. And I walk in and they all got their hands in the ears doing this weird language stuff and I freak out. <laughs> there ain't no way I'm hanging in here, brother. This is witchcraft or something. And I ran out the door and uh, something caught my eye. It was a female. Look, if you want to grow a big church, bro, hot chicks, front seat, you're done, okay? <laughs> I'm in trouble. I was in one church, Dave, and uh, I said to the, you know, if you want to grow a church, you just put a, a sign out the front saying, girls, girls, girls. And uh, yeah, it didn't go down too well. No, so I won't say that one. Oh, whoops. Anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, we're here for a good time, right? Anyway, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Uh, Someone get me a casket. It's not going well. Anyway, so I end up going back time and time again to this church because I want to impress this girl. I go to an all-night prayer meeting. This is so funny. They thought I was a Christian because I turned up the church. And uh, this is a prophetic word for someone tonight. Um, um, anyway, so we go to this all-night prayer meeting because we're praying for pubs to close down in Hamilton and it was so hilarious because they were closing down, but they were the pubs that I was going to and getting drunk at. And so I was watching all these crosses. Hey, I like that one. Don't, don't pray for that one. And anyway, so, um, so I go to this pub, uh, not this pub, this church, and, and I'm praying with them. And all of a sudden, at midnight, this is how serious they were, they put a video on from the Brownsville Revival. It was recorded five years previously. And anyway, this guy, I've never seen preaching like this. I'd been in church for six months, and I'd seen them spit like I am. I've seen them go, my spit's anointed. And I've, I, I've, seen, I've seen a fair bit. I've seen that sweaty armpits and all the rest of it. But this guy was awesome because he was Steve Hill, and he had a big axe on his shoulders, and he's walking around taking chips at the uh, altar and stuff. And God will cut you down, my friend. And he's going, for, and it's got my attention. But it gets better. Halfway through the message, he spins around, he points at the video camera, and he says, you, sir, the only reason you're here tonight is you've come to get a girl. Check. <laughs> gets better. Tonight, you're going to come forward to the altar, and you're going to cry and repent because you want to get her in the backseat of a car. I've got to do it how he did it, okay? And I just want you to know that not only that, you're addicted to alcohol, you're addicted to pornography, and you've got an anger issue. And I want to tell you that God has found you out tonight. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. OMG Christian styles, baby. And I was in shock. It was like someone had just got my heart, put it on the table, and smashed it with a hammer. I'll tell you what, I was putty in his hands then. He had my attention. And he said at the end of that message, you know, God wants to forgive you. You've sinned. You've made him angry, but he wants you to become his son. He wants you to know him. And if you want that, come down and receive Jesus tonight and say this prayer. Well, I look like an idiot, but I didn't care. I got in front of that 21-inch TV crying like a baby. And I said, Jesus, would you save me? Would you change my life? Would you, would you whatever that man says, I say it. I got home two o'clock that morning. I woke up at seven o'clock and all those cheesy Christian testimonies are true. The grass was greener, the sky was bluer. <laughs> the food even tasted better. <laughs> it was amazing. It's like the lemon detox, but only better. And everything was new. My, my alcohol addiction gone, my need for pornography totally wiped and my anger my frustrations was replaced with joy. My friends, the Bible was not lying when it says, behold, the old is gone. You become a new creation. And tonight I just wanna really get quickly through a word today because from that moment I said, Jesus, you changed me so much that I'm gonna do anything for you. I give up my whole life. And boom, here we are 12 years later. Change point, Tauranga. It hasn't been a letdown. It's been one wild ride, taking one high school dropout, gone through hell and back, hell and back, hell and back. Mate, the best ability you can have in Christianity, two of them, stickability and bounceability. 
stick at it and learn how to bounce, baby, because there is letdowns, there is hard times, but it's the refiner's fire. And God wants to shape and make you into the thing he predestined you to be before the beginnings, before the foundation of this earth. Come on, man, I'm excited about this Christian work. I'm excited all about that. I took a little bit too long. Pastor, when do I got to finish? Keep going. Keep going. Okay, all right. I was going to have the altar call now. <laughs> Look, I guess I would just want to talk a wee bit about you tonight and me. I want to talk about the fact that God does crazy things with you and me. He wants to do crazy things. There's a guy in the Bible called Moses. And if my text tonight was going to be anything, you could find it in Exodus 4.2. And God asked Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses said, a rod. Rather unimpressive, isn't it? You know, my life, my Christian life has always been one of just challenges. I always challenge myself to do something scary for God every year, something that's beyond myself because God has come through in so many ways. He's shown himself so awesome in my life. I mean, this most recent one, I guess, was having Reinhard Bonnke over in a conference. Everyone told me, don't even try, it's impossible. And yet God made it possible. Uh, there's been so many things that, that have happened in my Christian life that, that, that people say impossible, but it seems to happen because we, we, are, we are created to challenge boundaries that man put in us and trust a God that does the impossible on a daily basis. Minutural basis. Is that even a word? Minutural today. Okay. So, my question to you is what's in your hands? Is it a rod? You know, if you looked at your hands right now, you'd probably say, well, maybe there's a wedding ring, bit of flesh and blood there, Dennis. Actually, not much. If you, if you had a look at your life, maybe you're saying, well, I'm not that gifted. I can't. I can't do these musicians or what Pastor Dave or, or what my workmates can do. Maybe you think that your life doesn't amount to much, that you don't have much. But God is asking everyone tonight, what is in your hands? What have I put in your hands? And your answer may be, well, a dead piece of wood, a rod. I want to tell you that God speaks to dead things and makes them alive. That rod may be dead. But God wants you to see that become alive. He uses the broken, insignificant, weak things of this world to confound the wise, to display his glory. And guess what? If you're, if you're weak, if you're insignificant, you are just qualified for God to use you for great things. This is the God we serve. And you know, quite often we we. We, we, we kind of limit ourselves because of our past failings, because of our upbringing, because of our insecurities. And, and God's all along saying, what's in your hands? What's in your hands? And you're saying, nothing but rubbish, nothing but rubbish. And we come up with excuse and excuse and reason and reason not to trust God. And we never, ever fulfill the potential that has been birthed in us, that's been breathed in us, that's been preordained for us, for us from the beginnings of the earth. And I like Moses because I think we can all take lessons out of this dude called Moses. And if you know the story of Moses, it's a goodie, and if you watch VeggieTales, you know it very well because it seems like every VeggieTales has got something to do with Moses. I don't know what it is. I'm a, I've got three young children. I'm married to one wife. One's enough. She's awesome. Couldn't handle two. I know what it's like to be a Mormon in Utah, man. They've got like three or four. But anyway, and I've got three lovely children, and they love veggie tails. And so it's, it's better than the Wiggles, I've got to say. But anyway, uh, Moses, he was brought up in a Hebrew family very quickly. And then all of a sudden, you know the story, Pharaoh puts an edict, kill all the baby boys. And so for a series of miraculous events, Moses finds himself in the palace treated as if he was the son of Pharaoh. It's a pretty cool dude. You know, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's, that's like, okay, they're going to kill me now. I'm like king to be. That's, that's pretty out there. And so he, Moses is in this place, and then he sees that one of the Hebrew slaves is getting the snot beating them out of him. He turns around and says, hey, not my brother, and he gives him a hiding and kills a soldier. 
Moses panics, he runs out the door, he runs into the desert, and there he is in the wilderness for a long time, and he's picked up by a bunch of Midianites, he falls in love with a priest's daughter, he ends up looking after the sheep. And this is where we come to the story, that Moses is out, minding his own business, minding the sheep, and I sometimes entitle this message, what did my wife put in my soup? Because if you read it from a kind of not knowing anything about God point of view, you think this is a whacked out story, right? Because all of a sudden there's this burning bush and it's talking to him. Now, I've got a sense of humor. I'd be kind of like, wow, what's going on here? And this burning bush turns out to be God speaking to him. And, 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 and God's saying some pretty awesome things. He's saying, look, I'm going to free my children. Those Israelites that you see persecuted, your family, I'm going to set all three million of them free. And Moses is like in a Pentecostal service, baby. He's like, yes, wahoo, yes, we're going to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Go, God, go, God. And then God says, yeah, but I'm going to use you. <laughs> oh, no. You see, we always blame God either for bad things or we always want God to do the good things. And we never want to do anything for ourselves. But God works in partnership. It's partnership, baby. It's, it's, it's you doing your little bit and God doing the rest all the way through the Bible. You will always see it's partnership. And I'm convinced that God wants to use every single one of us in partnership to bring his kingdom here on earth. He wants to see the captives set free. He wants to see people free, man. Oh, come on, I'm a little excited about that. And so anyway, there's a whole lot of excuses that Moses uses to God. He has this, this talk with God and he says, God, number one, who am I? There's four things, four excuses Moses uses to God to tell him he's not going to be able to do this. And they're common excuses that I hear throughout the body of Christ. I have used myself, and I want to set you free from them today. Can you agree with me? Amen. Amen. Number one, Moses says, who am I? But God said, Moses, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? For all you Bible people, and praise God for you, that is Exodus 3.11. Moses saw himself as a loser. He felt incompetent. He allowed past failings to dictate his future. He allowed people's opinions of who he was to rule his life. However, God made a promise to Moses, and that promise is for everyone here. God replied and said, I will be with you, my friends. Really, we're not that great, but God is with us. When God is with us, that is awesome, man, because all the power of heaven is behind us. It's pretty powerful. You know, God never consults your past to determine your future. I praise God for that every second of the day because I've made so many mistakes. It's so awesome. Some of them are more spectacular. I used to say the higher, higher you, 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 you climb, the harder you fall, but it looks better. You know, if you're gonna fall, you might as well make it look awesome. And so, so one day I got into a business of importing iPods and I got scammed $350,000. That's pretty awesome. Anyone ever been scammed $350,000? You want to try it? It's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, so what happened was I imported some iPods, and back in the day, this was the most popular item, and nobody had them. And so I got 50 imported, and, and, and they all turned up, and I thought, well, there you go. That's awesome. So I went on the internet and skited about it and started a little business. I had tens of thousands of iPads ordered, iPods, sorry. And anyway, I put the order in. I sent the money to my supplier. You know, he still got my money. That was like 10 years ago, man. <laughs> oh, it was terrible. I had death threats. I had prison threats. I had every threat imaginable made against me. I lost so much money. You know, it's so awesome seeing $350,000 in your bank account. And then a week later, when you've spent all that money and given it to the supplier and everyone starts charging back their credit cards $10,000 at a time, and you're negative 10000 Negative 20,000, negative 30,000. I didn't panic until about 150,000 negative, but it, it became so bad. And yet, you know, sometimes we can use those failings as excuses why God will never want to use us. But God doesn't see us like that. He sees us how he created us to be. 
I take my text from Gideon. Gideon's a man of mighty courage. We, we remember that he sent out, what was it, 350 men to take on a quarter of a million people and won. But that's not the story. The story was he was scared and he went and hid in a wine press, cowering away, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, stand up, mighty man of valor. Did he look like a mighty man of valor? No, he looked like a chicken. He was scared. He was crying, cowering. Oh, please, no, no. I don't want to face my destiny. And God saw him as a mighty man of valor. And he did some crazy things, and God used him mightily. You know, that bad business could have derailed me. And maybe you've had some situations in your life which have completely punished you. But I want to tell you, it's not over for you. God has not finished with you. Failure is a stepping stone to success. Get bounce ability. <laughs> in harness racing, it was how much you could bounce when you fell off a horse. Two, I'm a little confused. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? Exodus 3.13. This is awesome. This is my revelation for today, man. This was pretty cool. It is interesting that God, that, that Moses asked that question. He says, and, and, and if they ask, what's your name? What should I tell them? Have you ever stopped to think about Moses' spiritual journey? Check this out. Moses was born in a Hebrew family. He would have known God as Elohim. He lived in Pharaoh's castle. You know how many gods the Egyptians had? And so when he's growing up in his formative years, he didn't have Keith Green playing in the background, baby. He had all the pharaohs and all their gods and all the worship. He would have gone to a few um, worship services in Egypt in the pharaoh's palace. He may have even prayed to the, those gods. This is out there. This is interesting. Then he runs away and he ends up with the Midianites. And they have hundreds of gods. This dude was a pagan. Oh, Man, that's pretty out there. And then God reveals himself in a burning bush and he does something really interesting. He reveals himself for the first time in the Bible as Yahweh. Before, it was Elohim with a whole different type of thing, but Yahweh, and why is this important? Because Yahweh means I am. It's the fullness of God. Everything God is, I am. He's gone through a spiritual progression, and it's like, goodness me, you know? Talk about messed up. And then all of a sudden, God speaks to him and says, I am. And this is the authority that Moses was to go back on. He would have gone back in there and said, Yahweh sent me, and they went, how, who? And how did he talk to you? Oh, uh, a burning bush, barefoot. Okay. But... (laughs) I am. I am is everything. It's the one that that spoke and created the universe. It is the one that breathed in a handful of dirt and created you and me. It is the one that rose Christ from the dead. It is is the it's the it's the one that parted the Red Sea. It's oh come on. It is the one that gives you every good thing that makes the sun shine in the morning. It is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. I am is the fullness, the definitive answer. It is everything you need. And I am sent him. Oh man, that's pretty powerful. You see, I've had some personal deep dark moments. I've doubted God's existence. During some of my most awesome ministry times, I've doubted even God's existed. That's pretty serious. What about evolution? What about this? What about that? What if we've got it wrong? What if? Is he real? Of course he's real. He just opened the eyes of that person over there you prayed for, you idiot. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, sometimes we go through stuff and Moses is like, man, I'm so confused. There's this burning bush telling me stuff and I've been through this. Oh, and then God says, but I am. And I am sent you. And it's the same for us. You see, I, I, I've been through everything, man. 
In my life, baby, I've been through the Catholic churches, the Anglicans, the Salvation Army, the Baptists, the Brethren, the AOG, Elam, Apostolic, non-denominational. Who's right? God? I am. And he's big enough to even use donkeys. He says he's going to make the stones cry out. I am, sent you, man. That's pretty cool. He's the one who's put the burden in your heart. He wants you to go do something about it. He's not gonna leave you high and dry. If you just trust, I am, everything's gonna be all right. Oh, come on now. Number three, what if they don't believe me? I've had this time and time again when I've been witnessing to people. What if they don't believe me? You know what? God had had enough. Mm. You know what he said? He said, I've had enough of your excuses, Moses. You see that piece of dead wood that's in your hands? That rod? Put it on the ground. So he puts it on the ground. All of a sudden, that piece of dead wood turns into a snake. That's a pretty freaky situation. Burning bush, wood snake. What's in my soup? (laughs) Seriously. And then God turns around and he says, I want you to pick up that snake, but I want you to notice something here. They didn't say go grab it by its head. He didn't tell him to be a Steve Irwin. Oh, crikey, mate, she's a bit cr- <laughs> You know what I mean? Oh, steady, steady, she's a bit cr- <laughs> No, that, the head bites. God told him to pick it up by the tail. That's the easy bit. You know what that tells me? That if we just do these natural, simple things, God will do the supernatural. It's the same when Peter's in prison and he's been in prison for healing some dude and he gets thrown in, great gift. Hey, thank you for healing the guy, go to prison. And he's surely facing execution. He's he's in big trouble. He's gonna be put on trial and the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, put on your shoes. Why? Because you do what you can in the natural and God will do what he does in the supernatural. Just an act of faith. God's looking for faith, faith. Faith is the thing that breaks down walls. You see, Moses' rod was only useful for a few things in the, super, in the natural, but in the supernatural, it parted a Red Sea. In the natural, it cracked open a rock and water flew out, flew, uh, flowed out of it. It's not the rod, it's the God that's using the rod. And in our hands, you may think it's only a rod. It's only insignificant. It's only small. It's not very useful. But in God's hands, that that piece of brokenness you have is enough to deliver three million people out of bondage. It's enough to change every situation in your life. This is the power of God. Use your rod. Use whatever you have in your hands and God will turn that around. He will turn your situations around and you can have breakthrough and you can break through for other people. How do I know? I've seen it in the book, but I've proved it in my life. I know this is real. Oh, yeah. Come on. Oh, come on. My friends, what's in your heart? What has God got for you? What's your dream? What's your vision? What's the prophetic words that have been spoken in your life that have laid dormant for years because you've been too fearful to walk out? Why don't you just walk out? Say, God. Because every one of us has the ability to change the world around us because that's how God has ordered us to be. We're nation changes, we're world changes, we're family changes, we're situation rearranges. Okay, I'm happy. I know I've gone far too long, but this is prophetic. Get it in your spirit change point. You've done so much, but there's so much more. There's so much more. Tell wrong I shall be one. Maybe. (laughs) Tell wrong it can be one, will be one, shall be one. When we get a hold of the principle that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And yeah, I've stuffed up big time. Yeah, I've got nothing. But God can take the little, the insignificant, the broken things and change the world with them. This is our God. This is how he works. Oh, come on. Okay. Number four, yeah, all right. 
We're getting to African American stage here. I've preached in one of those churches, baby. It's hot. We got the minute. I mean, I was over in America a year ago, and I got to preach in a Black African American church, and um, it was awesome. I remember going to Bay City in Michigan, and I was the only white person there, baby. And we're going in this big white Lincoln down the back streets, and there's bullets riddled all across the houses, and all these gangsters are like. And I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm dead. And I just sliver underneath my seat as we go into the church. Because <laughs> just a week beforehand, there'd been a shooting at the school. And one of the teachers that went to this church uh, laid hands on the dead person and he rose back to life. But that's, that's, that's how that is over there, right? And so, so I'm a little fearful. I go to this church and uh, they're doing all their praises and stuff. And I get up there and I start preaching and I start getting into it, baby. And I, and, and I, you know, T.D. Jakes, ah, you know, and um, a, a, anyway, we're going through the motions and, and all of a sudden I just feel the anointing hit and I said, hey, baby, it don't matter if you're black or white. <laughs> and all of a sudden, <laughs> not a word of a lie, every person was standing on their seat waving their little finger, oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> Not to digress. It don't matter if you're black or white in this place. It don't matter if you're short or tall, fat or skinny, smart or not so smart. God wants to use you in an incredible way that, that only you can be used for. You're, you're, you're so unique. I can't touch the people you can touch. Believe the God, the Jesus on the inside that wants out. Oh, yeah. Come on. Final one. I'm not smart enough. Gosh, when's this guy going to finish? Okay. We're going to have an altar call. Can we have the music guys coming up? Because we're going to have a party. Maybe. Don't get too excited. Okay. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant. Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Look, this is the modern equivalent of saying, look, I'm not smart enough. I haven't gone to Bible college. I didn't go to faith. Go faith. Yeah. <laughs> I've preached here before. It's a good place. Um, I didn't go to BCNZ. I didn't go and, and pass school C, nor did I. I failed twice, beat that. Um, I, 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 God, I'm just dumb. I just don't have anything that you could use. I, God, I, I'm the most... ADHD person you could ever know. I'm so depressed, God. God, um, you know, all these excuses. And God's reply is simple. Who gave man his mouth? Who made him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes it blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I'll help you speak, and I'll teach you what to say. In other words, if God has given you a passion for something, He will equip you to do it. Check out in Acts chapter 2, a bunch of rowdy fishermen get filled with the Holy Spirit. They've got no idea how to preach. They don't have a Greek lexicon. They haven't gone for humanutics. They've got no clue. And yet Peter stands up, accused of being drunk, and opens his mouth with the fire of God, with a vision burning on the inside of him, and it changes the course of history. My friends, greater is He who is in you. Greater is He who is in you. If He's given you a passion, if He's given you a dream, if He's given you a dead piece of wood, if He's given you brokenness, God can turn that on the head and bring life, liberty, and wholeness because that's what Jesus came to do. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news, to release the oppressed, set free. If the Son sets you free, you should be free indeed. This is our great and high calling. This is us as believers. Yep, you're stupid, but God wants to use you. I don't know why. He wants to use me, and He has. And He'll use you too. I'll finish with this. Facebook's awesome. I stole this. 
Jacob was a cheater. Peter had a temper. David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul, uh, Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossiper. Martha was a warrior. Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. Hey, look, Moses started. Zacharias was short. And Abraham was old. And Lazarus was dead. You're qualified. <laughs> okay. Seriously. God is not looking for the next superstar Christian. He's looking for everyday people who will trust an extraordinary God. You and God are a team that can never be beaten. You're unstoppable. Father, we just thank You tonight for activations that are going out, for things that are getting turned on in the Spirit that yes, I am more than able. Right now, I gotta give the invitation. If you've never opened your heart to Jesus and said, Jesus, I wanna make you my Lord. I want, I want to know what it's like to have a relationship with God. I wanna know what it's like to be a Christian. If you've never done that in your life, if you've never said, Jesus, I wanna make you Lord of my life, then in this place, in this time right now, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that. Well, maybe you're here tonight and you once were what you called a Christian, but you stopped going to church or you, or you stopped just believing. But tonight you wanna rededicate your life back to God, then right now I wanna give you an opportunity because the best part of your life begins at the moment you say, Jesus, I wanna give my life to you. My friends, if that's you tonight, just all across this room with every eye closed, every head bowed, this is a holy moment. If you wanna make a decision to follow Jesus or recommit your life back to Him, just raise your hand where you are. Come on, that's awesome. There's one. That's pretty cool. Come on. Awesome. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna open up the altar we're going to get the leaders and myself to pray for you. If anything that's been said tonight has activated something on the inside of you saying, hey, I want that, then I want you to come forward and get prayer. But also, if you've got any sickness in your body, any sickness in your body, then God wants to heal that today. I know that because I've seen it so often. Cataracts, gone. Cancer's gone. Rheumatoid arthritis gone. We were in Gisborne the other day in a tent meeting and this mongrel mob guy comes up to get healed. And uh, I just said, in the name of Jesus, gout, leave your ankle. And he was so blown away because all of a sudden he felt, he swore actually, he said the F word. Oh, so naughty. Anyway, and it sh he said, F, does that always happen? I said, what happened? I felt the F gout come out of my leg and through my toe. And I said, yeah, it does, because Jesus loves you. And then he got saved, and his whole family got saved. Oh. You, you had someone healed this morning. Come on, never give up. If you've been prayed for several times and nothing's happened, tonight's your night. Why not? Bounceability, stickability. Come on, so what we want to do is if you need prayer for anything, just come forward. And then just quickly tell us what it is for. If, if, if you've made a decision for Christ tonight, just come forward. We're gonna work you all out. We're gonna process you all, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And then we're gonna have fun, okay? If you need the infilling, the Holy Spirit in your life, more of God, anything, we just wanna pray for you and bless you tonight. Thank you guys, you've been awesome. Come on, let's worship and come to the front now. Come on, don't be shy. All of heaven.